1906 was a year which birthed many hallmark events documented by historians. But among the disasters that received global coverage, a secluded terror had entered our world on August 27th in the city of La Crosse, Wisconsin. A boy, born into an evangelical family whose zealotry would reshape and distort the boy's mind with an unjust hatred towards women of all backgrounds. The mentally troubled Edward Theodore Gein would become one of America's most infamous serial killers to ever soak soil in blood. His vile crimes spread sparkling crimson headlines across numerous publications, both American and international. But the few homicides and disappearances that had been linked to Gein were not what sparked such widespread interest in the man. Rather, his handiwork with exotic materials was what caught the eye of the public and sparked discussion. Ed Gein had been born into a life of abuse, trauma, and mental scarring. At birth, Ed had already been met with misfortune in the form of a growth on his left eyelid, leading to the development of a lazy eye. Thankfully, depending on your perspective, Ed had an older brother who would accompany him in the abusive future. Both mother and father contributed to the trauma the two boys suffered. Their father, George Gein, had been a chronic alcoholic who had been absent from his son's lives. On the other hand, their mother, Augusta Gein, consumed by Lutheran fanaticism, frequently proclaimed her hatred and disdain for George in front of her two sons. For the most part, Augusta had financially supported the family by way of a profitable grocery store, whereas George only worked to put a bottle in his hand. It was this behavior that prompted Augusta to restrict George from raising his sons whatsoever. As far as she was concerned, he was worthless and beyond redemption. The actions of both mother and father, as well as other individuals, would play their part in gouging Ed's fragile psyche. From a young age, he had been exposed to many troubling events. Some resulted in simple unexpected effects, crying and self-isolation, but a select few provoked deviant responses. One of the earliest incidents Ed retold occurred at age seven. In a shed behind the family store, Ed watched as his parents slaughtered a hog. He ejaculated during the process. As far as he could remember, this had been the first abnormal reaction he ever had. In the following year, 1914, the family moved from the city of La Crosse to a farm in Plainfield, Wisconsin. Augusta intended to leave the quote, immorality of the city and the sinners that inhabit it. Their nearest neighbors lived approximately a mile away, leaving both Ed and Henry rather isolated. Having now relocated, Augusta enrolled both Ed and Henry into a small one-room grade school which housed a dozen other students. During this time, Ed experienced endless bullying on account of his lazy eye and shy behavior. Adding to the ammunition, a lesion formed on his tongue, resulting in noticeably impaired speech. But despite his hardships through school, Ed attempted to bond with his classmates and form something resembling a friendship, a healthy behavior that would generally be supported by any parent, but not Ed's mother, not Augusta. She would physically and verbally punish Ed and his brother when they attempted to make friends with their classmates, the reasoning of which stemmed from their father. She believed that it was only a matter of time before the boys became failures themselves. Augusta had viewed simple social interaction as a sin which the boys were prohibited from partaking in. As for Ed's father, he would beat Ed whenever he came home crying from the harassment. There was no solace for Ed to find within either of his parents. His older brother had been the only one who was there for him, and vice versa. Over the following decade, Ed had dropped out of school in the 8th grade and had social and sexual restrictions placed upon him by his zealous mother. 
Ed, having suffered endless trauma, was compliant to his mother's demands. While Ed followed her will, Henry silently judged Augustus' domineering behavior. But for the time being, Henry did not speak out. In order to help support their family, Henry and Ed devoted much of their time performing basic maintenance and repair jobs for the local townsfolk. They garnered a positive and trustworthy reputation among the locals. With this public reception, Ed had been hired as a babysitter on several occasions. Due to his childhood trauma, and presumably his eccentric love for his mother, Ed found that he could relate to children on a more sincere level, more so than he could do with any other age bracket. There was finally some sort of joy in Ed's life. Whilst Henry and Ed found meaning outside of their abusive family, their father began to fall ill. The spiral of addiction finally took its greatest toll on George Gein. Drowned by the alcohol he so adamantly consumed, George became an even greater burden on the family. His sons and wife already feared and hated him for what he had done, spending much of what they had on his addiction until his eventual death on April 1st. 1940. But it was not his death that affected Ed and his brother to such a significant degree, but rather the ill speakings of their mother. She would routinely pronounce him hellbound, worthless, and deserving of this fate, furthering the mental damage and brewing stronger opinions between her sons. For the time being, Henry kept his words to himself, until he finally snapped. Henry began to speak out against his mother and share his perspective. He was concerned for Ed's well-being, aware of Ed's unhealthy obsession and the damage that it has caused. But Ed had no interest in listening to his brother. Instead, he was shocked by this change in tone, leaving him further afflicted. Near their home, in a squalid marsh, Henry and Ed had lit a fire to dispose of debris and vegetation they gathered from their land. The fire, erasing the grass around it, began spreading. The boys attempted to stifle the blaze, but had been overwhelmed by the spread. With additional assistance in extinguishing the fire, Henry was nowhere to be found. Ed had called for the aid of law enforcement, claiming that he was unable to locate Henry among the aftermath. Having arrived, Police expected to spend a considerable amount of time searching for Henry, but this hadn't been the case whatsoever. Instead, Ed had led authorities directly to Henry's corpse. Over the following days, the county coroner discovered some inconsistencies with Ed's injuries that would suggest the fire had not killed him. Aside from his clothing and flesh being absent of burns, severe bruising had been found on his head. With a thorough inspection, the coroner concluded that the cause of death was that of asphyxiation. Despite this, police dismissed the potential of foul play, as they did not view Ed as capable of murder. After Henry's suspicious death, Augusta fell ill, suffering a stroke. Although severely damaged, she would recover. This moment of relief was just that, temporary. A second and final stroke claimed Augusta's life, but not without her speaking her own concerns regarding Ed. Since dropping out of school, the books he read became increasingly troubling. Topics included head shrinking, grave robbing, and human anatomy. Feeling the stress and misery of his mother's passing, Ed sealed much of the family home in an attempt to preserve the rooms that his mother frequently used leaving but two rooms for himself. His already soiled appearance continued to decline, resulting in a filth on his person that was comparable to the untidy farmhouse. He lived off of odd jobs and the money he received for the sale of 80 acres of land between 1946 and 1956, land which was previously owned by Henry. Visiting the cemetery his mother had been buried in, Ed's sensation of loneliness intensified. With his knowledge of human anatomy and various other macabre practices, 
Ed found the new distraction buried beneath him. With a shovel in hand, Ed dug up his first body. His mother's. A year and a half old corpse. With his bare hands, he removed her decaying head from her shoulders, and, by following the directions in his book, shrunk the severed head for preservation. Under the cover of night, Ed visited dozens of cemeteries between 1947 and 1951. For the most part, he left each one without a trace. He was searching for a specific kind of target. Newly buried, middle-aged women. Scouring obituaries, he located at least nine lifeless victims to collect. At the same time, an increase in missing persons in the area sparked confusion among officials. Yet, Ed continued to evade any suspicion for quite some time, allowing him to continue partaking in his newfound hobby. During late August of 1951, after expanding his collection of corpses, Ed stopped at a bar, owned by a woman by the name of Mary Hogan. A middle-aged woman whose visage was reminiscent of Augusta, apart from the stark differences in her mannerisms and behavior. Her history was scandalous, and language overtly vulgar. Over the following years, Ed would become acquainted with Mary Hogan, sharing drinks and merriment in their off time. But as the end of 1954 drew near, Ed finally struck. At the tavern, Mary and Ed had shared drinks like they had done many times before. But Ed proposed they have some privacy. He turned the blinds and covered the windows. And without hesitation, Ed put a gun to Mary's forehead and pulled the trigger. The following day, Ed discussed Mary's tragic disappearance with a fellow resident of Plainfield, Elmo Uweek. During their conversation, Ed openly admitted to murdering her and said he hung her in his home. Like the police who received the coroner report for Henry Gein, Elmo was in disbelief and brushed off Ed's statement. For a few more years, Ed remained free. In late 1957, Ed made an inquiry regarding the price of antifreeze at a local hardware store. The following day, Ed returned to purchase the same antifreeze from the day prior. But that was not the only thing he intended to leave with. Bernice Warden, the owner of the shop, vanished the same night. Her son, Deputy Frank Warden, assessed the scene and found the cash register empty, blood on the floor, a 22 caliber rifle that had been left out of place, and a receipt for antifreeze, made out to one Eddie Gein. Soon after, police raided Ed's home. Subtlety was not Ed's forte. Upon entering the property, police found Frank Warden's mother decapitated and hanging from a wooden crossbeam in a shed. She had been split from the sternum to her genitals, with a number of internal organs removed and the remainder splayed out. By this time, Ed had spent many a year perfecting his craft and expanding his collection. He was more than a simple butcher, he was a craftsman of sorts. His horde of gore and macabre furnishings included lampshades, chair cushions, dishes in various cutlery, an assortment of refrigerated organs which appeared to have been partially consumed, a collection of preserved heads, a wastebasket, skull-topped bedposts, an assortment of severed noses, a box full of female reproductive organs, the head of Mary Hogan, left in a bag, belts made of nipples, corsets, gloves, leggings, an apron, a dress, a vest with attached breasts, and various masks made out of carefully removed faces. Ultimately, it was established that the purpose of this grotesque clothing was used as a means of fulfilling a deep-rooted fetish. Ed had displayed feminine traits all his life, most likely due to the influence of his mother, and sought to become a woman himself while preserving the memory of Augusta Gein. Ed confessed to each and every one of his crimes without any attempt to defend himself. As one might expect, when taken to a court, the trial was fairly clear-cut and simple. 
except for one detail. His mental state. The psychologist and psychiatrist who interviewed Ed had concluded that he was both schizophrenic and a sexual psychopath. At age 51, Ed Gein, saved from a life in prison due to his insanity, had been committed to a mental hospital. And, at a considerably ripe age of 78, after a long battle with cancer and a transfer from one hospital to another, he died a senile, yet mild-mannered and kind-hearted patient. When laying to rest next to his mother in Plainfield, only four individuals attended the burial. Since his death, Ed Gein's headstone has been vandalized on numerous occasions and periodically stolen. It now resides in the basement of the Plainfield Police Department as a keepsake to remind the village of a horrifying era they all endured. The influence that rippled throughout the world was not restricted to the confines of a cellar. Ed had been used as the inspiration for various films, novels, and even musical acts. The advent of Gein's deplorable crimes awoke a new interest in serial killers and their devious prospects. Thank you for your time and support, no matter how brief. I hope to see you all again. Have a pleasant day.